One, a few sentences before so that it, the whole thing fits okay, in the we'll maybe, s- maybe start here. The latest case acknowledged last week was directed by the operations division of the BND and ran under the code name Cat and Mouse. Mouse was the cat. The mice were the four German terrorists, Peter Jürgen Buch, Sieglinde Hoffmann, Brigitte Monhaupt, and Ralph Clemens Wagner, Wagner, who had escaped from Belgrade in 1978 to the Middle East. The money for the operation came from a high BND official who had opened an account under an alias in the Munich branch of the Dresden Bank. Between January 2nd and September 26th, 1980, five companies, including Fleek, filled the secret account with the con- contested 400,000 marks. This was exactly the sum that Mouse's insurance bonds had guaranteed as his lowest annual income. So, a couple of things to note here. Again, Hans Langemann, working with Hans Kolmar, former head of the West German Federal Police, the, R- the equivalent of our FBI, in setting up what was ostensibly a terrorist penetration organization, a counterintelligence organization, on behalf of BND, the same BND for which Hans Langemann had worked in a formal basis up until 1970. As we've looked at, uh, in, in the, as was indicated in the Counterspy article, that anti-terrorist group may in fact have been an agent provocateur organization. It certainly appears to have been responsible for several unexplained terrorist incidents in Germany. It's worth noting that uh, the private security agency that Hans Komar set up appears to have been involved working formally on behalf of BND, a similar pattern to what we've looked at in connection with spooks, the uh, use of private intelligence agents and, and intelligence services, many oftentimes in an official capacity. Now, again, the um, the uh, appropriate thing which, uh, which we should remember here, again, is that uh, Hans Langemann was the chief of security for the, U- the 1972 Olympics, and Ali Hassan Salome, who organized that massacre, later was working in an also a, an apparent anti-terrorist capacity for CIA. So uh, an, in- an interesting tangle of, of people. Now, one of the people who crops up in, in the, at the periphery of the Olympics massacre is Moamir Gaddafi. He crops up in two instances, one of which we're just going to touch on very briefly here before we go into another tape segment. Now, Moamir Gaddafi, uh, although not too directly connected to the massacre, welcomed the bodies of the the Olympics terrorists killed in the massacre as martyrs. Basically, he provided a hero's welcome for their bodies. Later, when Ali Hassan Salome staged a hijacking of Lufthansa airplane and obtained the release of the remaining Olympics massacre uh, veterans, they were received a, a live hero's welcome, I guess you could say, in uh, Libya from Gaddafi. So it's worth worth uh, looking at Gaddafi here for a couple of reasons. Not only his relatively peripheral, uh, albeit somewhat, uh, his, his contact and involvement with the Olympics massacre, albeit somewhat peripherally, but more to the point, although the actual hard accounts of the Olympics massacre generally don't refer to Carlos the Jackal, as ha- it's tough to see his name mentioned in the literature, in uh, the popular press, and also in Claire Sterling's work, you're going to see uh, Carlos the Jackal named as the mastermind of the 1972 Olympics massacre. Now, Carlos the Jackal and Moamir Gaddafi, of course, have a person in common. That person is Frank Turpel. As we looked at uh, in our Radio Free America number 4, Frank Turpel boasted of having trained Carlos the Jackal. Well, we're going to re-examine that uh, in a tape segment in a couple of minutes. It's also worth noting that uh, former Turpel and Wilson aide Kevin Mulcahy, who died under very strange circumstances before he could testify at Wilson's trial, Mulcahy testified that he saw Turpel and uh, Carlos the Jackal conferring on a yacht in the Thames River at a party uh, some years back. So that lends credence to Frank Turpel's boast. But bear in mind the connection, uh, according to the popular literature, although you don't see it in too many detailed discussions, the popular literature often refers to Carlos the Jackal as, quote, the mastermind of the 72 Olympics. It appears that Ali Hassan Salome was the actual man. However, bear in mind Carlos the Jackal's connection to uh, the Olympics massacre, according to some people, and also Gaddafi's peripheral connection to it, and their mutual contact Frank Turple. Reading a short section here about the Lee Lufthansa hijacking. Again from uh, the Quest for the Red Prince by Bar Zohar and Haber. But Salome had left Germany long before the search for him began. Back in Beirut, where he was fated and praised by Arafat, his first worry was to get the three remaining Munich terrorists out of Germany. He planned and commanded the Lufthansa hijacking, which forced the German authorities to release them. As I indicated, when they got to Libya, they were granted a hero's welcome. So, bearing in mind the relatively minor involvement of Gaddafi in this, the alleged involvement of Carlos the Jackal, and the curious uh, intersection of Frank Turple with both uh, Gaddafi and Carlos the Jackal, we're going to take a look at uh, 
Some information which is also contained, by the way, in our Radio Free America number four about Turple and Wilson, and which will be to a certain extent review for many of our listeners. Uh, but it's worth bearing in mind here, and remember also now, Qaddafi's Secret Service was put together by the very same scorzani led Nazi contingent that we saw in Egypt with uh, such luminaries as Adolf Eichmann, and which was responsible for developing the first Palestinian terrorist groups. All right, we're going to go back to the same hard rain segment we were listening to earlier. Um, it is going to be a longer chunk at this, ta- this time, and it's going to get a little bit into those uh, those folks we, we like to talk about so much. Mormor Gaddafi and his good buddies, Ed Wilson and Frank Turple. So coming up, a segment again from Dave Emery's Hard Rain. On Salome in our last broadcast as being the sort of main brain behind the 1972 Olympics massacre, a lot of the literature that you will encounter about the Olympics massacre will credit Ilich Ramirez Sanchez, better known as Carlos the Jackal, as having planned that particular massacre. In uh, the book that we looked at last time, The Quest for the Red Prince, as well as a Wall Street Journal article about Hassan Salome, no mention whatsoever was made of Carlos the Jackal. But again, in much of the literature on terrorism that one encounters, particularly uh, Claire Sterling's uh, work, you will see... The 1972 Olympics massacre as being sort of credited, I guess you might say, to Carlos the Jackal. Now, this is interesting for our purposes here in light of the fact that uh, there have been a number of sources which have reported that Carlos the Jackal, by Frank Turple's own account, was trained by Frank Turple. Frank Turple, of course, is the supposedly ex-CIA agent who received a great deal of publicity along with Edwin Wilson, for having uh, trained and armed Moammar Gaddafi and a number of other uh, third-world dictators and despots, particularly Idi Amin of Uganda. Now, the uh, information concerning Carlos's alleged training on, by Frank Turple was provided by none other than Frank Turple himself, although he didn't realize that this was going to become public information. Turple boasted of training Carlos the Jackal in an interview with a couple of undercover New York police detectives who uh, were successfully baiting Frank Turple uh, to... Well, basically, Turple tried to sell him a bunch of arms, and they arrested him. And uh, while conducting the discussions with Frank Turple for this arms deal, the agents were able to secure from him a statement or boast, depending on one's view, that he had indeed trained Carlos the Jackal. Now, the information about Frank Turple's alleged training of Carlos the Jackal was contained in a book called Libyan Sandstorm. Libyan Sandstorm was authored by a man named John K. Cooley, last name C-O-O-L-E-Y. Now, uh, John Cooley's Libyan Sandstorm was published in hardcover by Holt Reinhard Winston of New York City, and it's copyrighted in 1982. Now, not only does uh, Cooley point out or highlight uh, Turple's boast of training Carlos the Jackal, and perhaps that's an accurate statement, uh, one we really can't say. But uh, Cooley goes on to point out that there was a close relationship between the between Carlos the Jackal and Moammar Gaddafi. Gaddafi, of course, uh, the beneficiary of so much of the training and armament sent by Wilson and Turple. And uh, it's also interesting in light of the fact that uh, Moammar Gaddafi did figure a uh, very in a relatively minor way, in the 1972 Olympics massacre. As I mentioned at the top of the broadcast, the terrorists who were killed in the massacre received a martyr's burial in Libya, and uh, those terrorists who were captured alive and later freed as a result of uh, uh, Lufthansa hijacking, they, were, they received a live hero's welcome in Libya. So again, may, bear in mind uh, the Libyan connection to the Olympics massacre, the charges about Carlos the Jackal being the leader or the trainer of that uh, foray, that particular uh, undertaking. And keep in mind Frank Turple's statement that he trained Carlos the Jackal. Reading now again from Libyan Sandstorm by John K. Cooley, Holt, Reinhardt, and Winston. Investigating the arms traffic charges against Wilson and Turple that finally led to their arrest and first arraignment in New York in December of 1979, New York State undercover agents taped conversations with Turple in which he boasted that he had personally trained Carlos, one of the world's most notorious notorious terrorists, years after after the Venezuelans' earlier training in the USSR. Was this true or merely one of Turple's many exercises in self-glorification? Certainly Turple's claim is plausible. In late August of 1973, Carlos, seeking a secure base in London, rented flats in Bayswater and Apple Court as places of refuge. 
Carlos, who had never been to Libya, desperately wanted to meet Moamir el Qaddafi and offer him his services. On September 10th, 1973, Carlos contacted Hamid Habib, last name H-A-B-I-B, a young attaché at the Libyan embassy in London who was one of Qaddafi's close friends. Habib told Carlos that George Habash, H-A-B-B-A-S-H, the Christian Palestine, Palestinian physician who headed the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, one of the most radical of the Palestinian organizations, had recommended Carlos to the Libyans. After 12 days of reflection, Habib asked Carlos to fly to Tripoli. Gaddafi, according to two authors with close connections to Israel's secret service, talked with Carlos and agreed to help him. He insisted as the only condition that Hamid Habib should act as paymaster. In typically canny fashion, Gaddafi was ensuring that the funds he dispensed in liberation causes would not be passed out aimlessly. Well, it's interesting that uh, Frank Turple should claim to be the trainer of Carlos the Jackal, uh, who is frequently described as the world's most notorious terrorist. Because as uh, we've looked at in the past on this program, there is serious, serious doubt as to whether or not Frank Trouble was ever an ex-CIA agent, uh, although many of his undertakings uh, as a supposedly private citizen are the kinds of things that one would not generally assume the CIA would have been involved in. Actually, in point of fact, uh, there are a number of statements by a number of people who must be regarded as knowledgeable that Frank Trouble was not ex-CIA, that uh, these things that he was supposedly doing on his own were, in fact, deep cover U.S. intelligence operations. And very quickly, I'd like to review a couple of these statements. Information that uh, Turple and Wilson never severed their connections with the CIA was carried in a mercenary trade publication called Gung Ho. Gung Ho, as I mentioned, it is a basically a mercenary trade publication similar in scope and function to Soldier of Fortune. Now, in the June 1982 issue of Gung Ho... There's an article by a man named J. David Truby, last name T-R-U-B-Y, entitled High Stakes Mercs. Now, uh, in this article by Truby called High Stakes Mercs, basically there are a number of CIA officials quoted here, all of whom say that uh, basically Turple and Wilson never left the company, that uh, all of their activities on behalf of Gaddafi and others were undertaken as deep cover CIA operations. First statement to that effect here is going to is by a man named Theodore Shackley. Now Theodore Shackley, up until 1979, was the deputy director of covert operations for the CIA, and uh, in addition to that, Theodore Shackley was a business partner in some of the CIA corporate fronts that were set up by Turple and Wilson, and a very close associate of uh, both Turple and Wilson's as well. And uh, Theodore Shackley describes their work on behalf of CIA under deep cover as follows. When you get down to the bottom line, bottom of the line, when you get down to the bottom of the line basics, the problem is really simple. There are more people demanding more of a share of a rapidly lessening supply of natural resources. Theodore Shackley notes, quote, "Political ideologies will be meaningless. Vanishing raw materials coupled with increasing population and social, economic, and political upheavals will add to world instability. The Soviet challenge is simple: exclude the West from these materials." The world is rapidly running out of oil. Both East and West want it for themselves. The world is growing rapidly more hungry, and there are many more mouths to feed, yet each year less and less food is raised. The potential conflict over food and energy is coming to a hard, rolling boil very soon. Now do you see why it's vital that America keep these unstable areas on our side, Shackley asks? We must keep the Middle East and the Western camp. It's pure, simple survival. We need that oil. But while we're willing to share it, the Russians are not. It's the same with food, water, and other natural resources. Unquote. That's why the CIA has men like Turple and Wilson actively operating in these Middle East countries using such deep covers as they have. There are perhaps a dozen, a dozen other American mercs operating in the Middle East in the same fashion. It's our national security insurance policy out there, many insiders claim. And uh, still later in the article, another former CIA official named Ed Charles is quoted to uh, much the same effect quoting Ed Charles here. That's the major reason behind the deep cover for Wilson and Turple, deniability. They are painted as defectors to Libya, taking all sorts of sophisticated gear with them. Get serious. How could they smuggle all of that bulky technological material and those tons of explosives out of the U.S. and into Libya unless the State Department and the CIA wanted them and it there? There's no way. 
The company puts out the cover story that the guys are renegades who just happen to recruit some former, unquote, Green Berets and some former, unquote, Air Force technicians to go to Libya and help Gaddafi. Again, still quoting here. All these people are over there with the full knowledge and blessing of Mr. Reagan's CIA. They're babysitting Gaddafi to protect Gulf Oil's investments, which, of course, are parallel to American interests. Still later, the article quotes another former CIA official. This is a man named Colonel L. Fletcher Prouty. Well, actually, Prouty was uh, actually a colonel in the Air Force, and uh, his full title was Air Force Focal Point Officer. And what that meant specifically was that all CIA activities involving Air Force units or necessitating the use of Air Force units were to go through Colonel Prouty. He was basically a liaison officer between the Pentagon and the CIA. He was also the author of a book called The Secret Team, which is generally recognized as one of the best books on the covert U.S. intelligence establishment. Broadcasting from Foothill College, this is KFJC Los Altos Hills. And uh, in this section I'm going to read you here from the gung-ho article, Prouty again maintains that Turple and Wilson's activities on behalf of Gaddafi were not, that basically they were not ex-CIA, and that all of their supposed training of terrorists on their own really was undertaken on behalf of CIA. Recall that they also worked with Idi Amin, among others. Quoting Prouty here, Consider the raw oil from Libya and the Gulf Oil Corporation, for example. According to Ed Charles, this is not a quote here, according to both Ed Charles and Colonel Fletcher Prouty, the CIA considers Gaddafi an asset, however bizarre he may be. That's why there is a wilson Turple operation between Lebanon and Tripoli, to babysit the Gaddafi regime on behalf of the U.S. and Gulf Oil. Here, quoting, quoting Colonel Prouty here, Gaddafi is Gulf Oil's unwanted main man there, desirable, desirable or not. It's a quid pro quo situation. Gulf gets the Libyan oil and Gaddafi gets rich. That's not an especially unique arrangement, unquote, Prouty says. It's this arrangement that allows hundreds of tons of strategic material to go from American supply bases in both the U.S. and England to Libya, all of it bound for Gaddafi via his friends Wilson and Turple. Some 20 tons of C-4 explosive were shipped to Libya along with 300,000 delay timers, dozens of laser night vision surveillance cameras and, and, rifle scope, and rifle scopes, all standard and current CIA issue, some of it the very latest technology. Next, Prouty goes on to describe a base which he locates as being in Cheddington in England as uh, being one of the two major jumping-off points from staging areas for the CIA equipment bound for Gaddafi. He also says that a big U.S. op base in Tripoli was also figured very, basically figured very prominently in the, in the Triple Wilson arming and training of Gaddafi as well. Again, quoting Colonel Prouty here. According to Prouty, quote, much of the hardware was supplied from England because Cheddington, located north of London, is a large CIA staging area and base for the Middle East. Cheddington is the major CIA supply point for weapons and other equipment. We maintain huge storage and shop facilities there to supply sanitized equipment through our regular agents and their so-called mercenaries. There are also literally hundreds of tons of weapons stored there that were captured during the various Israeli-Egyptian wars plus Soviet ordnance taken in Africa, Asia, etc. Prouty says most of the supplies that went to Libya were delivered to a U.S. secret base near Tripoli. He recalls, quote, We bought the base outright from their government in 1944, and I understand that not only does the U.S. still own that base, but that it is a very active CIA operation. That's where the Triple Wilson stuff was brought in, and that's how it got there safely. I worked in that area myself, and I know what's there. Let's be realistic. Again, uh, interrupting here, still quoting Prouty here. Let's be realistic. You can't operate at that plateau in that area with those tonnages and with that level of sophisticated equipment without official U.S. sanction, unquote, Prouty points out. Again, quoting, Nobody just obtains a fleet of cargo 747s or the, of the, or the latest technology and hardware on his own and has the means to get it all to Libya. For decades now, American media politicians and military brass Excuse me, interrupting again, ending ending Prouty's quote here and continuing with uh, true, with uh, J. David Truby's account. For decades now, American media, politicians, and military brass have loudly blamed the Soviets for exporting the means and personnel of warfare to unstable lands. All the while, we're trying our own national damnedest not to be second best in the very same business. Last thing I'd like to look at on this broadcast concerns the 
assertion made uh, by both Ed Charles and Colonel Prouty in that uh, gung-ho article I just read you that Mohammed Gaddafi basically is considered an asset by the CIA. Now, I'd like to return just a second to uh, the book we looked at a minute ago, namely Libyan Sandstorm, authored by John K. Cooley, C-O-O-L-E-Y. Now, uh, Cooley in Libyan Sandstorm discusses a charge by a Lebanese journalist that not only was Gaddafi considered an asset by the CIA, but that he was, in fact, a CIA agent himself. This, of course, an unsubstantiated allegation. And uh, next, Cooley goes on to describe not only that uh, charge by the Lebanese editor, but uh, the fact that apparently the CIA was actually protect protecting Gaddafi's life. And specifically, Cooley describes what appears to have been the CIA's betrayal of a coup attempt against Gaddafi on the behalf of two pro-Western officers of uh, the allegations by a number of Arabs that uh, Gaddafi is in fact working for CIA, Cooley writes as follows in Libyan Sandstorm. Long before two former American CIA operatives, Frank Turple and Edwin Wilson, made their 1976 deal with Gaddafi to sell him their U.S. intelligence expertise and gimmickry, it appeared to many Arabs in the Middle East that Gaddafi had indeed, quote, made a pact with the devil, unquote, and was enjoying American CIA protection. A Lebanese editor friendly with many of the Western correspondents in Beirut used to comment, quote, Gaddafi is an American agent. He must be on the American payroll. How else can you explain some of his actions, unquote? And many Arabs shared this view. And uh, basically, Cooley goes on to describe two basic reasons that uh, many Arabs considered Gaddafi to be CIA. First of all, Upon assuming the control of the Libyan state, he undertook a number of foreign policy initiatives considered uh, basically detrimental to the Soviet Union. And uh, secondly, and most important uh, for our purposes here, apparently the CIA actively protected Gaddafi by uh, apparently pulling the rug out from at least two coup plotters against him. Continuing here with John Cooley's Libyan Sandstorm. Second... And what was equally or even more evident from the start was it was what amounted to CIA protection of Gaddafi's regime in person. First to learn to their grief of this protection were two Libyan colonels, Adam Al Hawaz, last name A L Dash H A W A Z, and the Musa Ahmed, last name A H M E D, the Defense and Interior Ministers in in Gaddafi's first government formed in September of nineteen sixty nine. Neither man was part of the inner circle, the first and second cells of revolutionaries who planned the coup. Both had been brought into the RCC fold at the last minute, RCC being the Revolution Command Council. Before the end of September 1969, Qaddafi, Jalud, and the other ten RCC members had moved out of their first headquarters in the broadcasting station to the Azizia barracks near the gates of Tripoli for greater protection. That name is I-Z-Z-I-Z-I-Y-A, by the way. Soon it became apparent that all was not well in the RCC. There was quarreling over priorities, jobs, and other matters. Precisely what happened with Ahmed and Hawaz may never be known. It is clear that Gaddafi, inclined to be overcautious to the point of paranoia about people he didn't completely trust, knew or thought he knew that some kind of conspiracy was brewing among the outsiders, unquote. Men like Ahmed and Hawaz, who had operated on the fringes of the RCC and who now controlled the security forces in the defense and interior ministries. At some point in early December 1969, either the CIA station chief himself or another U.S. agent operating under military or corporate cover warned Gaddafi that there was indeed a conspiracy brewing against him and that his least trustworthy associates were Ahmed and Hawaz, the two pro-Western senior officers. On December 11th, Gaddafi's personal security men seized Hawaz and Ahmed. They were tried and with six others, sentenced to prison terms that were later increased at a new trial held by popular demand, unquote, in October of 1970. So there, there's possible indications of actual CIA protection of Gaddafi's life, as well as uh, arming and training his military and intelligence forces. That basically winds up the broadcast for today. We're going to be continuing. And uh, actually, that basically winds up the broadcast, period. That, again, was a hard rain broadcast originally with Dave, uh, well, with Dave Emery originally broadcast about, uh, what, 1983? Tail end of 83. Tail end of 83. All right, we're going to take a musical break to give you all a chance to get up and, folks.
That's basically what we're talking about tonight. Um, we are, uh, as usual, talking about it um, somewhat obliquely, going around in uh, circles, but that's the way these things go. They tend to go around in large circles. There are very few state, uh, straight-line uh, movements in the world of international terrorism, intrigue, clandestine operations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We've been talking about long, circular movements uh, that tend to involve both the left and right, although in the case of most of the things we've been examining tonight, they are things that involve the left by by um, purposeful implication on the part of the right. And uh, we talked, of course, at great length during the uh, Mediterranean Merry Ground broadcast on the events surrounding the assassination attempt on Pope John Paul II about the Italian fascist strategy of tension, um, the idea of using uh, terrorism by the right, blaming it on the left, and using it to manipulate the populace toward the right. And we, of course, have been examining Middle Eastern terrorism in particular tonight, but uh, as many people are aware, most Middle Eastern terrorism these days is written off as being either a solely an indigenous uh, outgrowth of, of regional problems, which of course is true to an extent. There are the problems there, and uh, they would be exploited uh, by somebody. It just in this case, we're looking at many of these problems have been exploited very specifically, starting with the uh, the Germans, uh, the Nazis, specifically coming out of World War II with the aiding and abetment of the American CIA, and that is what we've been talking about in the larger sense. Let's uh, sort of quickly sum up what we've looked at so far. Just a quick rundown. We began, as Nip indicated, by taking a look at a bunch of Nazi war criminals operating under the auspices of the CIA and Galen organization who put together the Egyptian military uh, intelligence and secret services. We took a look at Otto Skorzeny, the uh, key Hitler commando uh, operative, well, the man who was in charge of Hitler's commando training, his role with those very same Nazi war criminals, including, among others, Adolf Eichmann himself, the uh, chief of the final solution. We also looked at the fact that during that particular foray, or that, that during the stay, I should say, of the uh, Nazi Galen contingent in Egypt putting together the secret services, the first Palestinian terrorists were put together under Skorzeny's auspices. That very same Nazi intelligence group then put together the Libyan secret service for Moammar Gaddafi. Then we took a look at Ali Hassan Salome, the man credited with masterminding the 1972 Olympics massacre. We took a look at the fact that he was, by July of 73, working as an informant for the Central Intelligence Agency on security matters, protecting American diplomats abroad. We also took a look at the fact that he was the son of a man named Hassan Salome, who in turn was the key aide of a man named Hajamin al-Husseini. We took a look at Hajamin al-Husseini, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem and spiritual leader of all Palestinian Muslims. He also, incidentally, was a major in the SS and a key Third Reich functionary. One of the missions undertaken by Hajamin al-Husseini's forces was an attempted uprising in Palestine to divert British forces away from the Battle of the Bulge. One of the key lieutenants involved in leading that, well, the, the leader of that mission for Hajamin al-Husseini was Hassan Salome, the father of Ali Hassan Salome. After that, we took a look at both Hajamin al and, uh, Hassan Sal Hajamin al-Husseini and Hassan Salome's retrenching after World War II with regard to the Israeli War of Independence. We also took a look at the fact that Ali Hassan Salome, son of Hassan Salome, who was eventually killed by his Israeli commando raid, Ali Hassan Salome not only spent a lot of time in Germany, but eventually married into the Grand Mufti's family. Following that, we took a look at Hans Langemann, the BND official who was in charge of security for the 1972 Munich Olympics. We took a look at him uh, doing away with indications of uh, Nazi Chancellor Kurt George Kiesinger's Nazi background and also working an agent of influence close to President Nixon. Perhaps more importantly, after that, we took a look at Langeman, again, a BND Galen operative, also chief of security for the 72 Olympics. We took a look at his role with a man named Hans Komar in putting together terrorist groups, allegedly to penetrate the terrorist underground, but perhaps, as indicated in that article, to set up provocations. That a group appears to have uh, established or set off at least several terrorist bombs to which no other attribution had been made. We also took a look at Moammar Gaddafi, the man who received both a dead and living uh, terrorists from the Munich Olympics and hailed both as martyrs and heroes, respectively. We took a look at his role with Frank Turple and Turple's role in turn as a, quote, ex-CIA operative. As indicated in the tape segment you heard a short time ago, he was not ex-CIA at all. We also took a look at the role of Carlos the Jackal, credited by many with being a key player in the Olympics massacre, and his connections to Frank Turple. And again, the whole Turple, Carlos the Jackal, Gaddafi connection we looked at at much greater length in Radio Free America number four, available from Davcor, and that's where we've gotten to so far. All right, we're going to go on and look a little bit more about the very specific manipulations of people like Otto Skorzeny in the matters that we've been talking about. We're going to go now to a book that we quote from a 
from a great deal, a book that, uh, that I can recommend unsparingly, an excellent book called The Great Heroin Coup, subheaded Drugs, Intelligence, International Fascism. The book is published, uh, was published in 1980 by Dial Press, uh, South End Press, I'm sorry, and uh, written by Heinrich Kruger. And uh, he's talking about the initial references to CORU, C-O-R-U, a Cuban right-wing anti-Castro organization. The common dom- denominator in CORU, as well as Internacional Fascista, a combine of anti-communist extremist organizations chartered at an October 1976 meeting in Rome attended by Karu representatives, appears to have been the CIA, or at least a faction thereof. Karu's headquarters are in Miami. Originally, it was sustained by tight collaboration with the CIA and the Chilean junta secret police. By the way, the Karu is an anti-Castro group here, previously as indicated under CIA auspices. According to the form, to Cuban former CIA agent Manuel Darmas, the CIA coordinated DINA's acts, which is the DINA's, the Chilean secret police, with Karu's and supplied the latter with funds, advisors, and explosives. The head of DINA's Miami-based force was reportedly Eduardo Sepulveda, or Sepulveda, the Chilean attaché in Miami and a top dog in DINA. Internacional Fascista is the outgrowth of many years of planning in Madrid by the late Nazi Otto Skorzeny, who in the 50s had worked for the CIA. I might stop and insert parenthetically here that uh, you will remember when we were reading E.H. Cookridge's book, and I think one of the other books, too, suggested that uh, the reason that uh, uh, Skorzeny was so loath to leave uh, Madrid was because of his uh, prosperous business and mining interests, etc., etc., and the suggestion was that he was uh, an amiable businessman who had to be coaxed out of retirement to get back into the uh, hurly-burly world of uh, of espionage, treachery, and death. Um, Well, as we're going to see here... uh, uh, at former SS Colonel Scorzani was in fact involved in a lot of things that had nothing to do with legitimate business. By the way, in our, our third Radio Free America show, the one about the Galen organization, we went into Scorzani's role at great length, not only the very same material about his Middle Eastern forays, but also the fact that he was, by most accounts, the head of the Odessa, the post-war Nazi SS organization, and uh, was very active with those very same SS men in a number of different capacities, at what point, at one point, placing the entire Odessa at the behest of CIA. On the rolls of the International Fascista are former SS agents, OAS terrorists, hatchet men for Portugal's dreaded secret police, PIDE, terrorists from Spain's Fuerza Nueva, Argentine and Italian fascists, Cuban exiles, French gangsters from SAC, and former CIA agents hardened by terror campaigns in Operation 40, Guatemala, Brazil, and Argentina. Besides Karu, international fascistas militants have at various times numbered the Army for the Liberation of Portugal, ELP, and its Adjunger Press contingent under Yves Guerin Serac, the Italian Ordine Nuovo, led by Salvatore Francia and Pierluigi Concutelli, Spain's Guerrillas of Christ the King, Asociación Anticomunista Ibérica and Alianza Anticomunista Apostolica, AAA, which is not to be confused with the Argentine AAA that is also represented in International Fascista, and the Paladin Group. SS Colonel Scorzani was the kingpin of the Paladin Mercenary Group until his death in 1975. Dr. Gerhard Hartmut von Schubert, formerly of Josef Goebbels' Propaganda Ministry, was its operating manager. Headquartered in Albufera, Albufera, Spain, its actual nerve center were at Scorzani's Export-Import Offices and Cover Firm, MC, located at a Madrid address shared with a front for the Spanish intelligence agency, SCOE, under Colonel Eduardo Blanco, and also an office of the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency. The cozy relationship of Spanish right-wing terrorists with U.S. and Spanish intelligence is further underlined by the SCOE's purchase in the mid-70s of Warbell's silenced M10 machine pistols, prior to which the ideal terrorist weapon had been unavailable in Europe. Shortly thereafter, the M10 turned up in the hands of Spanish and Italian terrorists. A melange of former OAS and SAC figures and West German rightist activists and mercenaries, Paladin joined terrorist actions in Europe, Africa, Latin America, and even Southeast Asia. Along with Italian fascists, Paladin is responsible for the December 17, 1973 bombing of Rome's Fiumicino Airport, which claimed 32 lives. On behalf of the Spanish government, Paladin kidnapped and murdered leaders of the Basque ETA and, in 1974-76, engineered some 50 bombings in Basque country. Paladin's bank rollers included Scorzani's weapons empire and Libyan head of state Muammar Gaddafi. The Scorzani-controlled World Armco, with main offices in Paris, 
was registered in the name of Paladin Manager Von Schubert. Upon the death of Scorzani in 1975, Von Schubert moved to Argentina, but returned six months later to reorganize. Internacional Fascista was a crucial first step toward fulfilling the dream not only of Scorzani, but also of his close friends in Madrid exile, his close friend in Madrid exile, Jose Lopez Rega, Juan Perón's gray eminence, and Prince Justo Valerio Borghese, the Italian fascist money man who had been rescued from execution at the hands of the World War II Italian resistance by future CIA counterintelligence whiz James J. Angleton. They, and other Nazi and fascist powers throughout Europe and Latin America, envisioned a new world order built on a fascist iron circle linking Buenos Aires, Santiago, Lima, La Paz, Brasilia, and Montevideo. So it's, uh, let's pause here and, and take a look at a couple of the key items in that particular passage. Now, we're talking about an organization, obviously a fascist organization, called the Internacional Fascista. That organization involves, among other things, the Paladin Mercenary Group. Now, the Paladin Mercenary Group is uh, referred to, uh, Otto Scorzani is referred to as the kingpin of that group, but perhaps more significantly, well, just as significantly for our purposes here, one of the key bankrollers is none other than Moammar Gaddafi, the same Moammar Gaddafi we've taken a look at in a peripheral role with the 1972 Olympics massacre, the same Gaddafi who has received obvious assistance from CIA and in the person of Turpel and Wilson, the same Moammar Gaddafi whose Secret Service originally was put together by those the same Nazi Galen contingent operating at the behest of CIA under the very same Otto Scorzani who was cooperating with Gaddafi in the Paladin Mercenary Group. It's also worth noting here, for our purposes, that uh, three key names that we looked at in connection with the Pope shooting from the uh, Mediterranean Merry-Go-Round series, Prince Justo Valerio Borghese, Pierluigi Concutelli, and Jose Lopez Rega also crop up in this context. Now, Pierluigi Concutelli we looked at as basically the trigger man for Stefano Della Chiai, one of the, well, I guess you'd have to say one of the dominant people on the far right scene today internationally. Pierluigi Concutelli was involved with the attempted assassination of Bernardo Leighton in Rome that we're going to take a look at, a, an exiled Chilean diplomat. It's also worth noting that uh, Pierluigi Concutelli and Stefano Della Chiai, some of their, their key terrorist incidents, such as the uh, Piazza Fontana massacre, were assisted by CIA. Prince Justo Valerio Borghese was an intimate of both of these men and a man who planned a 19, an abortive 1970 coup in Spain that we're going to talk about, in Italy rather, that we're going to talk about a little later. Uh, Borghese is uh, a person who's going to figure very prominently in, a, in the discussion to come, so remember him. He, he was, as I said, one of the key luminaries of Italian fascism, the person who attempted, who's, uh, in whose name a coup was attempted in 1970, which also received funding from CIA through Michele Sindona. Borghese is also a person we're going to look at in connection with the development of suicide weapons, as well as Otto Scorzani, that we're going to take a look at a little later. But uh, bearing his, bearing, bear in mind now his role with Pierluigi Concutelli, Stefano Della Chiai and others in the Mediterranean merry-go-round series, the strategy of tension that Nip referred to earlier. Earlier, also Jose Lopez Rega, a member of the Argentine branch of P2, and also uh, a key member of the, a key person in forming the death squads in Argentina. Jose Lopez Rega, like Borghese, like Pierluigi Concutelli, a key player in our Mediterranean merry-go-round series. Uh, but the, all three of those people are front and center in Radio Free America number eight, or number nineteen, the third of our, our uh, Pope shooting series. Before we continue on and look at how some of these groups, uh, their activities dovetail together into a, uh, a repeat of the strategy of tension not only in Italy but in places all over South America, Central America, and other parts of Europe, I uh, just wanted to mention again to bring this stuff up to date, lest uh, sometimes occasionally it seem uh, rather obscure to the, uh, the new listener as to how it ties into current events and things of that nature, we might just mention it. Uh, Dave had just spoken of Jose Lopez Rega, the man who, among other things, helped to put together the Argentine death squads. Um, Jose Lopez Rega himself, of course, ties heavily into the Mediterranean merry ground we discussed earlier, but for our purposes, what I wanted to point out was that the Argentine death squads then, in turn, were hired by the CIA to train the Nicaraguan Contras. So, again, the process is continued of our own intelligence services hiring uh, mercenaries and, in fact, in many cases, outright murderers and turning them around and using 
using them to further U.S. covert political aims while the American taxpayer foots the bill. And this, in fact, is what's going on right at the moment and what, uh, in fact, we are footing the bill for right at the moment. Incidentally, we looked at that in detail in Radio Free America 15 about the Argentine connection to the death squads and to the Nicaraguan Contra training. All right, going back to Heinrich Kruger's The Great Heroine Coup, he points out why it's sometimes difficult to track some of this down and uh, by implication for our listeners, why sometimes some of these things we talk about seem rather surprising to people who have heard the, quote, official story. What has made sleuth work difficult is International Fascista's attempts to camouflage itself as an arm of the left. When General Joaquin Zenteno Anaya, Bolivia's ambassador to France, was shot down in Paris in May 1976, a caller to the police claimed the Che Guevara, che Guevara Brigade had murdered him to avenge the 1967 capture of Guevara in Bolivia. An eyewitness, moreover, claimed to have recognized the assailant as the infamous left-wing terrorist, Carlos. However, one month later, the Nouvelle Observateur reported that the assassination had been planned at Madrid's Consulade Hotel by Bolivian intelligence agent Saavedra and three terrorists from the Paladin Group. Furthermore, inspection of Zenteno Anaya's politics revealed his opposition to Bolivian President Banzer and allegiance to ex-President Torres, whose murder in Argentina followed shortly after Zenteno's. Then it was the turn, the turn of former Chilean Foreign Minister Orlando Letelier to be murdered by Chilean and Cuban terrorists in Washington, soon after which the establishment U.S. press, citing CIA and FBI sources, pointed the finger at the Chilean left. In connection with these assassinations, it's appropriate here to quote in its entirety a recent report entitled Latin America Murder, Inc. Quote, a still classified staff report on questionable foreign intelligence operations in the United States prepared for the Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee on International Operations shed some new light on cooperation in security matters between Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, Paraguay, and Uruguay. According to the Senate report, which has been leaked to the press in the United States, the joint operation is known as Condor. The Senate report mentioned a Phase 3 of Operation Condor, which involved the formation of special teams to carry out, quote, sanctions, including the assassination of the enemies of its constituent governments. Okay, before I continue, let me just reemphasize that fact. Uh, again, we're talking about a Senate, a U.S. Senate document, which reportedly has information on this particular operation, a very large operation known as Condor. The Senate report mentioning a phase three of Operation Condor, which involved the formation of special teams to carry out, quote, sanctions, including the assassination of the enemies of its constituent governments. Bear in mind, we've just read that a large part of the plan here is not only to assassinate these people who are a pain in the side of these constituent governments, but to make it appear that these murders were committed by the left. Quote, the best known killing of this type was the bomb attack on Orlando Letelier in September 1976 in Washington. Condor's role in this emerged during the testimony of the FBI agent Bob Shearer, who investigated the case and gave evidence at the trial of Michael Vernon Townley. He testified to the use of Condor as the channel by which the Chilean DINA chief, General Manuel Contreras, tried to get U.S. visas for two of the agents involved. An impressive list of murders may now be laid at the door of Operation Condor. These include the killings of General Carlos Prats of Chile and Juan José Torres of Bolivia, in Argentina, the Uruguayan politicians Hector Gutierrez Ruiz and Zelmar Michalini, also in Argentina, Bolivia's General Joaquin Zenteno Anaya, and Uruguay's Colonel Ramon Trabal in Paris, and the attempted assassination of the Chilean Senator Bernardo Leighton. Uh, interrupting that, of course, was accomplished by the aforementioned Pierluigi Concutelli at the behest of Stefano della Chiai with an Ingram Mac 10 mentioned in the previous passage, Nip Red. The Senate report disclosed that Condor had considered establishing its own operational base in Miami in 1974, but that this was headed off by a CIA protest, quote, through regular intelligence channels, unquote. In this case, the CIA informed the Chilean DINA of United States displeasure, and no Miami station was opened. According to the Senate report, the FBI concluded early in its investigation of the Letelier assassination that the murder might have been carried out as a third phase of Operation Condor.